All right, are we on the eve of destruction? You tell me. This is the Far North Tactical Saturday morning wake-up call. Good morning. I am Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine, here to make sure that the buttons get pushed and the airwaves get coated with, well, liberty. Can, can you coat the airwaves with liberty? Anyway, we're here to uh, certainly not to tickle your eardrums, but to provoke a little thought. Make the, them bleed. In the studio with us this morning from Far North Tactical, Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Steve. And from Bighorn Enterprises, Josh Bennett is in here. Good morning. And do we want to mention the other two people that are in the studio? Or Not just, really. All right, they're workers. Then. Oh, no, we might as well. All right. <laughs> Abe Froman, Sausage King of Chicago, actually. <laughs> Abe Tolman, thanks for being here this morning. And uh, I believe we have another Bennett spawn somewhere in the background. Is that uh, Israel who came in there yep. this morning? Yep. Good morning, Israel. Good morning, one and all, and uh, welcome to the wake-up call. And that would be You're your going to take talk, it or right? what? Do the thing? I'm or? not even awake yet. That's why we have coffee. That's why it's called the wake-up. Exactly. I guess I'm going to go then if you're not. Yeah, go ahead. Bang, bang. Listening to Lou Rockwell on the way here, which I'm still kind of buzzing from last week's show. Listen to it at couple times on KFAR. We're gonna, hopefully, Mr. David will get it shot up so we can put it in the on the blog. He said he'd have it by Monday. So, I was listening in to his uh, podcast today, and it was really interesting, which I thought about it before, but it's just great the way they're putting it, how empires, basically, is what we have. We always have to have governments. The state always has to have the boogeyman. Right, because if you don't, the citizens, if they're just kind of lollygagging around and not worried about anything, eventually they start thinking, why am I being robbed so much to have this state in power? I'm doing fine. There's nothing bothering me. And they start thinking a little too much, and they start getting a little bit too, if you think about it, they start getting a little bit too libertarian because they start thinking, I don't need these guys. So they got to find their boogeyman which we had the Soviet Union for 60 years, 50 years, something like that. Actually, no, 70. 70 years. years. Well, if you, I mean, it was founded in 1917 and collapsed in 1991, so. Cold War was basically about 60. Yeah, they weren't our boogeyman until about the 50s. Until was, we needed them to be. It sure. wasn't until Germany was gone that uh, we needed another boogeyman, so. Yeah, so we right, had. Germany was a pretty good booger, booger man. The Soviets were going to come kill us all at any moment. So we had to have. The state had to grow, and it grew, and it grew, and grew. Well, unfortunately for the state, the, Ro- the, so- the Roman Soviet Empire fell. And it took them, shoot, over 10 years to really come up with another good boogeyman, which is terror. And terror is probably the best boogeyman they've ever invented. They're, f- they're quite smart because you can never defeat terror because you can't point to it. Wait you can't point to who it is. It's just a... Are you, are you telling uh, me you can't go to war against a tactic? No. And you can never defeat it because at any moment, at any time, someone might scare you, which is what terrorism is, is to terrorize. You think that's why so many Americans are going to jail for terror? Right. We have the ultimate boogeyman that'll never end. Well, until we finally go... Well, each, every time we finally start lulling down, like, yeah, we haven't been attacked, not so much, blah, blah, blah. You get what happened here with the FBI and the supposed Fed building that was going to get bombed in New York and the great plot. And see why you need us? We saved another terrorist plot, even though it was a plot that the FBI went out, recruited a kid, gave him the means, gave him the target, gave him everything that he needed and said, this is what we want you to do. This is where we want you to bomb, blah, blah, blah. Then right when he shows up to plant this fake bomb, they solve the plot and everyone's safe and... So that's they, not, they that's not the that first going. time they've done Didn't they do that with the Capitol building, too, not that long ago, where it was actually the FBI who recruited the guy? Yeah. Schaefer Cox, I think, is the case in point, this whole thing that happened here. They put a guy in there, that, and he was the instigator for everything. Yeah, he came up with the 241 plan. Yeah, the FBI. That was an FBI plan <laughs> to save us from terror. So then they stop it, and then they say, yep, you're safe. You need to keep paying us. Plus, with well, a great thing, if you look at how wonderful this terrorist plot is the government has grown in the last 10 years phenomenally. I and mean, this has been the best apparatus that's ever come along for the state. 
is terrorism. Because you can't ever stop it. It'll always be there. If it's not there, you create it. And no one can point to... I mean, I don't hear anyone saying, oh, they shouldn't have done that about the Federal Reserve Building. They're, your local Joe is like, oh, they saved the Federal Reserve Building. Now everyone who's against the Fed is going to be associated with terrorists because... Uh, let's see. Hmm, I'm pretty stupid. And... Uh, <laughs> That guy's going to blow up the Federal Reserve building, and so people that don't like the Federal Reserve, obviously, are all terrorists, guilt by association. I just think it's fantastic. They've done a fan... I just clap. They did a fantastic job. Terrorism has been the ultimate epic boogeyman. Good job. I know that uh, at the end of the Cold War there... In, in the 90s, that was the there was a big debate in the Pentagon as in what they were going to do with this gigantic apparatus that they had that was literally built for fighting the Soviet Union, and they literally came up with all kinds of ideas. They were going to, I guess it was talked about, uh, they were going to bring them, you know, bring all those all the troops home, and we're going to fight drugs, we're going to fight everything here, and then 91 came around and gave them a little bit of a re- reprieve and gave them a little bit of a another direction to go and then of course from there on out it just kind of just spiraled on oh hey terrorism that's a good idea yeah that's a good idea you know there's another one in uh bristol bay i think king salmon in particular i remember reading about a guy there who recently converted to islam fbi sent in one of their spooks got to be friends with him and after a couple of years he convinced them we need to go we need to do something we got to go So he's going to convince them that they needed to bomb something. He never actually did anything. He was actually, I think, he flew to Anchors to visit his wife or whatever to talk to her to tell her about what was going on. And, oop, they got him. Foiled another plot that we invented. Just what a joke. What's really scary is that people are so stupid they don't even put this connection together. Even when they get told and they know in their heart, at least, that the FBI created this problem to stop it so we'll clap our hands and give them more power to protect us so they can come up with a bigger plan to stop so we can clap our hands and they can just this revolving circle it's it's the paddle in the canoe and you just paddle one side you go around and around and around and around except the canoe's getting bigger and bigger or maybe it's the ponds getting bigger and bigger and bigger and never get to the shore pretty sweet yeah that's the thing that's a bit that about terrorism that's so crazy is the fact that it doesn't matter how many times you go after anybody there's just more terrorists oh yeah um that might be directly related to the fact that when you um go after the terrorists their families don't really like it and come after you well in america you create your own terrorists because you just write up and little I, laws and I, define I what i see where, what josh is saying with that but um if you're going to talk about legitimate terror, which there doesn't seem to be a whole lot, especially in light of what Josh is talking about, almost every plot that you hear about, even in London and all over the world, is instigated by us. But when you do talk about um, an Islamic person, you know, I I don't think you can actually call acts that are happening in countries that we're occupying terror. I don't think that's fair at all. No. Yeah, retaliation is actually probably yeah, a retaliation better. would be a lot better word. Or guerrilla warfare. I mean, if you look at historically, how did when the American Revolution began? Yeah, you'd have to. Com- wouldn't wouldn't you have said? I mean, if you look at it from just the take away the the sides and just look at you've got the British Empire. You the, you basically, as far as they're concerned, the rightful rulers of that land, there to basically ensure the safety of the colonists, to make sure that the king gets his due taxes and his due proceeds from the colonies, and all of a sudden you have this splinter group that starts bombing stuff. They start taking the tea and dumping it in the harbor. They start assassinating local officials. Steve, are you saying that America was founded by a bunch of terrorists? I am saying (laughs) that that is exactly what it is, that if you look at it simply on the actions that were taken by the people that are revered as the founders of our country, by anybody's definition, they were criminals, they were murderers, they were terrorists. The British government treated them that way, too. Exactly. Didn't they all, most of them ended up hanging, right? I mean, when they pledged their, their lives, their, 
their, their fortunes and their sacred honor. Yeah, that's it. And they knew that they were getting into out of the people that signed the Declaration of Independence. I think only a handful survived the Revolutionary War. Most of them ended up losing everything, including their lives. So if you look at, again, you know, it's like you're saying, the, the point of view means everything. Right now, the United States of America is, is exporting democracy. Where does that find, Where is that found in the Constitution? Where in the Constitution does it say that we have the right to have a military base in Germany for 60 plus years? Or in Japan? Or in Saudi Arabia? The Constitution is only for people that are inside the United States. Uh, well, doesn't the Constitution govern the actions of those who are members of the United States? Um, I'm pretty sure that the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution and things of that nature were written for Americans. So anybody that doesn't live here doesn't deserve any of those things. Well, we don't deserve them either. I was just reading the <laughs> Violent Radicalization and Homegrown Terrorism Prevention Act of 2007. Their definitions for violent radicalization. The term violent radicalization means the. This is pretty interesting. This is what Congress put. This is the meaning of it. It Means the process of adopting or promoting an extremist belief system for the purpose of facilitating ideologically based violence to advance political, religious, or social change. Now they do throw violence in there. But the means of process of adopting or promoting extremist belief systems in there, too, which that's kind of scary. Because what's a radical belief system, according to the state, anything that doesn't bow down to the state? Anything that's anti-state. Right. So basically, if you start preaching some false religion against Caesar, if you start questioning the the idea that you should not worship Caesar, that's a false religion in terms of the state's position. So this shows terrorism. Technically. Should be. Yeah, or anybody who thinks that the states got too much in their own business. Just, that would be most businessmen. <laughs> That'd be almost yeah. Great, Steve. You just made a bunch more terrorists. No, oh, well, no, actually, I think the government made the terrorists, but I just think it's a great thing. Is there any terrorists that weren't created by the government? I. Let's just see. Let me think. Is there is there any actual link to Islamo fascists wanting to bomb us because of our um, our passions for liberty? <laughs> That's what we're told. No. Well, unless is there, liberty is, is. Is there any Islamo fascists anywhere in the world that have done anything to us prior to us occupying them? 1979, when the Shahs or when the Shah was overthrown in Iran. Yeah, and, and our embassy was overrun. We were already occupying them, though, since 1953 when we installed the Shah. And the, our CIA actually trained their police, and they were the most brutal police in the world at the time. I mean, they had price controls, wage controls, and all that good kind of stuff. And if you actually got caught selling something for a higher price than the Shah dictated, they took you into the town square and took your shoes off and beat the bottoms of your feet till your feet fell off. Arabia, before it became Saudi Arabia, we turned it into Saudi Arabia because we set the Saudis up as the uh, center of power. And they have such a brutal regime that they have two standing armies, two fully equipped standing armies. And they're totally um, um, independent. independent of each other. Uh, 100%. They're not allowed to interact at all. And the reason is, is, in case one ever turns on them, they have another army to fight their own army. How corrupt and how <laughs> bad do you have to be to have to have two armies, one to fight yourself? And they're 100, 100% put there by us. And they have the most brutal regime out of all of the... They have the most terror going on. Their government institutes the most terror out of all the Islamic nations. How hated would China be if they came in here and set us up with a new government that maimed, tortured, killed us, and raped us for everything that we had? Did you know that uh, Saudi Arabia it has one of the biggest debt burdens out of all of the Arabic countries? And they make more money than all of them. 
Why do they because, have a debt burden? Because they're because the Saudi the Saudi family spends money faster than their country can make it, even though they make more than all of them. Hmm. Yeah, they're pretty much hated by their own people. Yay, America! Well, you, you, you look at it, this isn't an awful lot of it has to no, do No, the, they hate us because we're free. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, the, even the interventionist policies of the United States of America, that, that really doesn't all of it go back to World War One, back to Woodrow Wilson, back to that, that time when all of even uh, Teddy Roosevelt, where we we're projecting ourselves abroad for the sake of American interests and in, in setting up American military bases in other places so that we could go and defend our interests, no longer defending our borders, but defending our interests. It really started when we decided to go west across the Pacific Ocean. And it was actually kind of a quote-unquote plot by the United States Navy to get a bigger Navy. They wanted more ships. They wanted a bigger Navy. So one way to get that bigger Navy was to push the trade routes to China and the Navy said, well, if we're going to have these trade routes, then by golly, we need to have all these bases along the way, so let's go free the Filipinos from themselves and kill 100,000 of them or so and kick the crap out of them. They never liked us being there, by the way. Let's, uh, we pretty much overthrew... That, that was during the Spanish War. Right. But that's what that's where it originally came about, was that we were going to free all these people from Spain right, to put our own bases in so our Navy our Navy bigger so we could protect our interests. Our, our history books now show that um, we sank, which, which ship? The Maine. We, the Maine. We sank it ourselves. Mm-hmm. It, it was a plot by our own president. That's, like, that's mainstream knowledge now. It's not conspiracy theory that we sunk our own ship to instigate a war with Spain to, in, to uh, push our interests. And they weren't very happy about the war because it didn't last very long. It was a splendid little war, and I quote. <laughs> yeah. Are you uh, quoting Teddy Roosevelt there? The one who was led, it Roosevelt? I don't think it he's was the, Roosevelt. Roosevelt was the one who resigned his position as Secretary of Navy so that he could go and lead the charge of San Juan Hill. Yeah. No. I think, was but, it McKinley that was uh, president at the time? M- McKinley, I, I think McKinley took over after... And I know. I mean, know that Roosevelt was was uh, McKinley's vice president. Oh well. Here's here's what I think. Half her ended history lesson here. We made a deal with the Filipinos to help us fight their occupiers, which was Spain. So we made an alliance with the Filipino people, and they helped us fight the Spaniards, and we helped push them out of their country. And as soon as we got them out, we refused to leave, and we annexed the Philippines. Well, the other th- can you believe it, Josh? They went to war with us. One of the they had things divine right to be there. Which president was it? I'm, I'm looking on 1898, the Spanish-American War. Hmm. Well, one of the things the president at the time said, <coughs> one of the reasons he wanted to go free the uh, Philippines. Looks like it was McKinley. McKinley. One of the reasons McKinley gave to fight them was that he said they needed to be Christianized even though they were predominantly Roman Catholic at the time, but he said they needed to be saved. So that was one of the ways that he got the stamp of approval was to go promote li- liberty and Christianity. They, so did, they did a pretty good job of that when they um, slaughtered 110,000 of them. Well, they that, sent them to heaven that, right away. That, that's only... Um, that 110,000 number is only the figure that they have for when they change their policy from... Um, fighting people that obviously we decided to occupy the Philippines so there was guerrillas fighting us people trying to throw us out of their country imagine that but the 110,000 is only the number that they come up with after they change their policy to kill women and uh, men women and children kill them all attitude total warfare very christian yeah of course it is the thing is that that i find completely amazing about that is you know it's like you guys were saying, basically the our foreign interventionist policies started to really show themselves, you know, at the turn of the century right there. But I mean the root of where those interventionist policies really come from, I mean it spawned way back, I mean, even before the Civil War. I mean it, it, it comes out from this idea of we have to do goodness to other people. And the only way to do goodness is to be you know, is to 
establish for them laws, rules, and regulation. And beat them up. Yeah. Well, and, obviously, and, they're not moral on their own. We have to force them to be moral. We have to force them to make that good think, moral choice. Right? I don't think history shows that as much as it shows um, the same thing you hear today. I mean, when they come out and talk about what we're going to bomb these people for, bomb these people for, what do they call it now? I mean, they don't even have, like, fancy names for it anymore. They just straight up say, for Not interests. True. Yeah. Um, National so interest. Our interests. Our interests. Our interests. What are our, what are interests? I'm not even sure what American boys go die for that we dub as interests. So we don't even know what we're fighting for anymore. We don't even have a clue why we're throwing some bombs at Libya or going into here or there. Well, I think it's pretty telling. Um, if you start looking at the wars all the way from the time that Jefferson went and fought the Barbaries all the way through the Philippines, and, I mean, and Josh spelled it out, why we had the opening conflict with Spain in the first place. It's for interests. We will take a vested interest in people that give money to politicians. And it's always to grow the state. Well, sure. I think McKinley was a Republican, wasn't he? No, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, of course he was. Yeah. All the really good wars get started by Republicans. Yeah. Other, otherwise, they're evil wars. I don't know about that. World War Two. World War One. World War One. Right, those those were evil wars, weren't they? <laughs> I mean, the, the very fact that you can have a good war or a bad war to me is like saying, well, that was a good murder or a bad murder. I personally, you know what? I want you to know that I am not anti-murder. What kind of a ridiculous thing? How many people do you hear that say, well, I'm not anti-war? Everybody should be anti-war, shouldn't they? Mm-hmm. Well, the point of it is that war is for the growth of government. It's for the states. What we started out with, the reason why we have terrorism right now and the big scare for it is to grow the state. Look how big the state's gotten since 9-11. It's huge. It's gotten huge. Both sides of the spectrum. I mean, you can't look at either side anymore and mm -hmm. see which one of them wants to rein it back because they're just like, you get... I promise to grow government less. Than my I opponent was reading something about uh, Romney, and they were talking about, you know, he's a small government guy and blah blah blah. And then they then they said, well, how many wars do you think they're gonna that he'll promote? And went through about nine of them. Whoa! And it was just a you know play. They're playing around. It's just like, well, I think first we should bomb Iran. Well, maybe Iran, then Syria. Well, maybe Syria, Iran, China. Maybe we should bomb. And he just went through this mm -hmm. list until there's nine of them. Well, that's not going to be smaller government. And he guarantees he wants to go to war. He tells us every time he talks, I will not. I'll kill them suckers. You think this this guy, oh, Obama, he's bad on foreign policy, blah, 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 blah. I'll show you how to get her done. Mm -hmm. I'm going to kill some folks. Well, that's going to grow government. Wars grow states. That's why they have wars. The only reason the states go to war is to get bigger. It's not to get smaller. We're going to go to war so we can stop the growth of government. Isn't yeah. it only states that can go to war, too? I mean, uh -huh. I, can't, I can't go to war. I mean, as soon as I say, oh, I'm going to war, I mean, my neighbor's like, yeah, okay, pulls out his gun and finishes the war right there. <laughs> well, you see, and that, that's the thing. If you did it, it would be called murder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. If the state does it, it's called war. You know, or, or, you know what, if you get several of your friends gathered together, it's called conspiracy. And mm -hmm. then you can all go to jail just for talking about it. But if you're state, you yeah, can have a Yeah, but doesn't the state or even the individual have the right to self-defense? Only under common law, which we haven't no, been I mean, practicing in this country for almost 100 everybody years. Everybody in the world recognizes natural law, right? So the individual has the right to self-defense. Wouldn't the, then the state's made up of individuals, wouldn't they have the right to self-defense? Okay, let's give it. Let's just give you that. The state has the right to self-defense. Right. So don't we um, have the right to go to... So, so the last 160 years, what war have we fought for self-defense? Well, the war in the Middle East, of course. Aha! <laughs> when we were invaded... Against terror. By... Right, I mean, how many times in the last two years has um, guys like Randy called up and you know made the point that... If we didn't do the things that we're doing, I mean... They would be here. I'd they, rather fight them over there. Right. Yeah, that's a good point, though. I mean, if we're going to fight, I'd rather go and fight in somebody else's backyard than in my backyard. All right, but isn't isn't it a fact that... Um, what? Yeah, it's that time already. Okay, we'll bring it back when... Uh,
we come back. <laughs> we'll take the call. Stay, we'll take the call or two. All right, we're going to take some calls. Four five eight talk is the number. Right after the Fox News here on KFAR Local Talk Radio, streaming live at KFAR 660.com. Also, incidentally, available on your smartphone with the free TuneIn Radio app. Check it out for yourself. Tune in the radio on your smartphone. You can listen to KFAR in the local radio section, and it really is us. It's not just some station that sounds like us. Check it out for yourself and tell all your friends, and you keep it here on KFAR. All right, welcome back to Nottingham right here on KFAR. This is actually, uh, we call this the Far North Tactical Saturday Morning Wake Up Call. Uh, all right, gentlemen, uh, during the break, you guys were getting into a conversation, and I, I wanted to bring that here on the air because I think it might be a little illuminating for those who advocate, well, you know what? Let's say we don't go to war. Let's do something different. Let's make sure that all of our other options are on the table first through diplomacy, perhaps an embargo, some other sanctions. Right. We, all of our greatest up. conversations are in between in the breaks. I was going to say, if you just have uh, continuous breaks and not, don't get on the radio, then it's a lot more fun. Yeah, it might be better. <laughs> yeah, and embargoes. What do we, we, right now, we have an embargo against Iran. That's an act of war. Iran by the embargo, has the right to attack our ships, in my mind. Because if you, you know, we think it's peaceful, you get the Secretary of State up there and say, we are going to use all peaceful means possible, starting with an embargo where they can't sell or trade anything unless we allow them to. I like I like the way Josh laid it out. He said it would be the same I- idea that if um, France surrounded England with a bunch of ships and said, you're no longer allowed to trade with um, Holland. That's an act of because war. Because we're laying down an embargo. But this isn't war. We're not having an act of war. We're having a peaceful embargo. We're using the, the we're going back three or four hundred years ago. If France put their ships in front of England and said, okay, Holland, you can no longer sell to these people. Because <laughs> they're bad. But this is a peaceful means of nonviolence to get England to do what we want them to do because they won't sign our peace treaty, so we're going to use nonviolent means and peaceful actions to starve their people, and when enough of them die, they'll turn and bow their knee to us. Well, actually, Holland and England basically would be able to declare war on France, actually, have, and they would have then. It would be like, yeah. game on, boom, but, boom, boom. All right, now take, take it back out of the, the perspective the historical might have been and look at what has gone on just in the last... 20 years. Look at our um, exactly. Look at our embargo on Iraq. How uh-huh. many children? I mean, they used they were documenting for a little while all of the children that were dying. Five hundred thousand. Right. How wasn't that an act of war? It was. If five hundred thousand children died here in Fairbanks, there's not even that many. No. Well, no, what? it was an act of war. Our embargo on Iraq was an act of war. Five hundred thousand children died. That's documented by the UN. That's been admitted by our State Department, and our State Department at the time was Madeleine Albright, and she said that was an accept- acceptable loss for us because and we didn't lose anyone. She said that was an acceptable loss for our interests, right. actually. 500,000 kids. Well, that's an act of war. So we wonder why when we go liberate them and kill more of them, they get pissed off and want to fight us. It's because they hate liberty and <laughs> democracy, Josh. Well, and from the fact that we have embargoes with countries, how many countries do we have embargoes with? I think anyone that doesn't have a democracy is pretty much mm-hmm. embargoed by the State Department right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, take, what, half of South America, probably... All of Africa, Korea. North well, Korea. Incidentally, and you're, using, it, you're actually using the threat of violence with yeah. an embargo because you're That's saying true. it's peaceful is what how they act. Well, we're going to use all peaceful means on the table. But how do, how do you enforce an embargo? You have to with actually physically. With great big yeah. ships, frigates, and battle cruisers, and no different than you missiles. Know, just two just ago. two weeks ago, Aircraft we had carriers. the most the uh, the most massive exercise in the history of the Persian Gulf in which we had, uh, I would say, like 60 different countries participating along with the United States in a show of force off Iran's coast. So we were showing off, is basically what you're saying? Well, we were pulling a Teddy Roosevelt in terms of saying, look what we could do to you. This is what we're going to do to you if you don't bow and do what we tell you to do. Why do we need to do that anyways? With a country that has 9,000 nukes, 5,000 operational nuclear weapons, what kind of... Why, Why do you need anything? Yeah, how how many Triton subs do we have? And each Triton has um, 
24, or uh, 24 nuclear missiles, and each one goes out into the stratosphere and breaks into 12 separate ones. They can hit 12 separate targets. That's well, like I, 244 I, per, per I, sub. I think if the United States launched a up. nuclear weapon on somebody, that there would be enough, uh, retal- or enough retaliation around the world that we're not willing to go that far yet in our mass murder. Oh, it doesn't matter, because we could probably just kill them all. We probably Five could. times over. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll use Bring an embargo which is, before we nuke everything. Which is why, which is why it is that so it's threatening to those in power, whether they're Republican or Democrat or whatever, to have any other country get that same power as us. Because we have that ultimate trump card. We can say, look, all right, we're going to play in the sandbox with you. We'll, we'll we'll play with these little toys. The, these Turn the sandbox into a glass box. Exactly. <laughs> you know, we always have that threat in the background. And if anybody else gets that threat... Now we're no longer the big bully on the in the playground. Except what we've done is we've left our sandbox and we go to everyone else's sandbox and poop in the sand. <laughs> and then we say, uh, eh, and we go back to ours and say, why is he so mad at me? Well, we, we better take yeah. those calls. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, call. You still there? They are not. How about you? Good morning. Are you still there? Uh, yes, I am. What's your name? Jerry. Jerry, what's on your mind? You know, um, I love listening to you guys. I love the history and I love the current events that most people aren't aware that are going on in the world. I listen to you all week long, and my only gripe every week is poor Schaefer Cox. He's a kid that had an opportunity to create a militia in Fairbanks, a real militia, that now it's been, it's wasted, because nobody else could come up and step up and create a militia. Can I ask you a question real quick? How well did you know him? I didn't know him other than everything I've read in the articles. Right, well... I've kept track of, of all the comments when people post in the news miner and all the people... Two, two of the friends. four guys in here were pretty close friends with him. Well, yeah, but the, the fact of a militia is you don't advertise. You're there when the people need you against the government, but you don't advertise to the government that you're there. What is the primary function of a militia? The primary militia, in in my definition of it, is to protect the people. How does in it the protect event. the people? You, if you're a member of that militia, you take up arms when you're needed. Martial law, the government coming in and saying, you guys don't have any rights left. We're in charge. You're going to do this our way. And so, if you look at historic Revolutionary War, not a lot is known about individuals in the militia, just a few. So you're saying he should have just should have just kept his mouth shut, sure. Well, the anti the sovereign state stuff, mm-hmm. he should have kept that in his back pocket. If that was his belief, he shouldn't have tried to get other people with to come forward with that same belief because there it is. You're be- putting a flag on yourself and saying, "I'm anti-government," and right now I'm getting a bunch of guys together with guns who don't believe in the government either. Mm-hmm. Look at us. Let me, let, me, let me take you one one more step here. Historically speaking, how has the leadership of militias been chosen? By the individual. Right. So if somebody comes up and steps up in front of the militia and says, I'm in charge, and somebody else says, well, we should vote on that, and he says, no, we're not going to vote because I'm in charge, how would you view that person? Well, see, he would have to be willing to make his views at the time of the vote just like our politicians now, but make what, his views at the time. I, I, I personally everybody. really don't care to vote anybody into a power position over me. Well, well I think know, I know what you're. I think I, don't vote the same way this whole government stuff is. Right. You know the guy. You're familiar with the guy. You've worked with him side by side. Generally, that's how militias were formed. So basically, are you saying that we were pitying, giving too much pity to Schaefer? It's kind of what you're saying. Well, yeah, because. He brought it upon himself. Yeah, yeah we have I said tried. that. We do believe that he did some stupid things. Our our point, or my point with it, is that I still don't think he should be in jail. And it was really sad and scary the way that the whole thing came about. Because, for one, the FBI is the one that instigated the 241 thing. They made it up. The well, FBI yeah, was, made up the 241. He was set up because of the things he had already said. It was easy to create a, a backstory to make him a danger. 
Sure. Because he'd already run his mouth. Yeah, and the the problem that we have with the whole thing is that a jury found him guilty, and it's bad for the rest of our society. It's bad for everyone here in Fairbanks now because who wants to open their mouth and say anything about anything? Because the government's going to come running in. And it also gives the FBI, one of the other reasons why we bemoan that he was found guilty was it gives the FBI a lot more jurisdiction well jurisdiction it makes them a lot more like hey we got away with it again let's do some more there's got to be some more guys what's that radio station again (laughs) yeah yeah that's the dirty word now militia is the dirty word sure well liberty is the dirty word i mean yeah aaron and i were standing around a bonfire the other night and and he told me he's like you do realize that just by being friends with me you've probably put yourself on a radar and it's like and it's like that's 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 kind of weird to think about it's like all we do i mean when we're working throughout the day, which we do occasionally some of the time work, you know, uh, when we're all, we talk about liberty all the time and never once does it come up where we're like, oh, we need to actively do something against the state. I have, I, I like to think this at least, I have no aggressive, attacking, destructive bone in my body. At the same time, I love liberty and I want liberty so bad for me and everyone around me. And so I talk about it all the time. That's why I ask Aaron, hey, could I go on the radio show with you so I can talk a little bit about liberty? Hey, you weren't supposed to talk. Oh, that's oh, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that. I'm supposed to be quiet. <laughs> but, the, but the point is, is that something as innocent as just talking about liberty, a.k.a. I don't like the government, I think they're pushing down on my throat, can actually put me on the FBI. And they, and they can start saying, hey, you know what? We're going to come up with uh, some sort of way to uh, shut these guys up. Because the more we shut these guys up, the less they talk and the less we have to worry about them ever speaking out against us. Right, and the biggest thing with Schaefer is that he went to jail for, um, I mean, he didn't go to jail for it, but he got convicted of trying, of conspiring to um, kill people that didn't even exist. And I think that sets a pretty scary precedence. Yeah, but we do agree. He, His big mouth put him where he is. <laughs> well, yeah, because, well, you know, in effect, you know, no offense to your friends, he was a young kid. And I have a, I'm I'm ex-military. I spent the whole 90s in the military. And guerrilla warfare is still something. I was trained in it for five years. Used it against my own soldiers, and we never use it against um, enemies. It's still, look at me, I've got the biggest toys, I've got a big truck, <laughs> i got a big tank, look at me. And, you know, right. Joe Blow with his little gas can and his, cell phone takes care of that big thing mm-hmm. and that's right. basically the way a militia fight and which is which, i could not get any of my fellow guys to even ex-military guys to even consider looking into that militia because he was a 26 year old kid at the time that said i no the military commander of the militia. yeah exactly and he he set himself up as the commander of it and would not allow a vote of the people that were affiliated with it so i mean that's just one more thing. So you know, I've got I've got a, a lot of fellows I work with. Um, you know, uh, don't wait. Don't advertise that too much because no, you're going to end up on it. You know what? In fact, uh, I'm getting the signal. I need to let you go before right. they they move in on your signal. Four five eight donk is the number. Good morning, caller. This is the wake up call. Who's this? Hello. Hey, who is this? This, uh, this is Dan. Can Dan. you hear me? I, Dan, I can hear you. What's on your mind? Uh, well, all I'm I won't make this quick because I'm working, but I do want to say shame on you guys. You have bad-mouthed a country that is the greatest, largest, freest, wealthiest nation on earth. Yeah, we got problems. My gosh, yes, we've got some hang-ups and, and problems. But you're making it sound like we've been foul and nasty and rotten for the entire 200-plus years of our existence. I did say We're 160. We're a warring nation. You're terrible. Yeah, he he did there. say 160. And, and actually, I, I need I need to do a fact check on you here, sir. Dan, where do you get off saying that we are the freest nation on earth? I've been to these other nations, many of them. Have you? Yes, actually, I've been. Um, so one, they, twenty, yeah, some, I've been twenty, thirty. So, I've been to quite a number of nations around the world. The fact of the matter is that we are now eighteenth. No, we're eighteenth if you uh, go uh, with economics alone, because actually we're not the wealthiest nation; we're the most debt-ridden nation. So we're eighteenth in the world in economics, and we're number ten in overall okay. general for liberties. But that's that's only if you go to an outside source besides somebody who's been drinking the God Bless America Kool Aid. Well, and we'd like to be uh, more you free. Guys, you want to? You want to? Is, is make there any problem with nation? wanting to be more free? That's absolutely a good point. not. But. 
you're making it sound like this nation has been a, a horrible, horrible nation. No, all no, no. Of its this gov- the state. You've made the state with government. yourself a few times in there that, oh, my God, all we do is go to war and take over people. Yet every country that we have gone into, occupied, had war with, and walked away from, has ended up a richer, healthier nation than it was before we Saudi got Saudi Arabia? Korea, uh, God, all of them. Well, we the away from Japan. Look what happened there. We're Before still there. Before we got to these nations, we still they have were troops in Japan. Oh, we haven't walked away from Japan. They run themselves. They run themselves. They now have their own military, their own economic system that we helped set up, and because of that, they are a very rich, very wealthy, have, very. Prosperous have you actually country. been to Japan? Yes, I have. No, all right. When when you say they run themselves and they have their own military, I mean, I'm I'm kind of confused because we we still have our own. Representatives there pulling a lot of the strings. And didn't Japan just sign some sort of big bill in their own parliament that basically said we want the United States off of our land right now? They, and so the United States government is moving bases well, off guys, of Japan. Well, guys, go ahead, go ahead. Be be the men who tear us down rather than help to build us back. First, first of all, and there's a big difference you're doing between here us. You're doing nothing but damning. The uh, state. As a country and a no, nation. No, the state. That, that is not the people. The, the state. Uh, you just lost me off your radio program, guys. The people of the that, United States are <laughs> awesome. I it's the government. Anyway. <laughs> the I, state. Whatever. If if we said something that wasn't true mm-hmm. in the last 50 minutes, then should have pointed that out, because everything we said is absolute fact. Verifiable. And you know what? Here's the thing. And it's, this great it's, state it's, that you're, that I know you're still listening this great state that you want to talk about? What about this great state that's putting concentration camps up, FEMA camps, all over the United States? Who do you think they're for? They're not for immigrants or illegal aliens. They're for people, dissidents, for American people. Now, here's the problem, too, FEMA is that even if, writes about if, it. if Come you, on. as an individual, are getting so threatened by the, by the words that are coming out of our mouths that we are making you question your unwavering faith in Caesar... America, America, right or wrong? If, if that's happening, and, and, and you're getting to the point where you're saying to yourself, I can't even listen anymore. Why? Are you, have you been, is it so threatening to your way of life to consider any other kind of way of thinking? Is it going to make your entire life fall apart? Yeah, the things that we talked about were bad things that this state has done. We didn't make any of that up, and we're pointing it out doing. to say that we need to stop. What's wrong with that? I, I don't think any of us are saying we need to blow up more the United States or, no. or, or that we need to, to make it crash. If, if people want to hear me say something good about America, the American people are the most amazing people on the planet, hands down. What, oh, we've, achieved, what we've achieved through the ideology of free markets is unprecedented. We changed the whole world. Literally, I mean, I believe that the well, state sucks, be- though. Right, and I, but I 100% in my heart believe that capitalism in America, which started out as 100% free markets, rode America to where it is now, kept us free just because uh, S- Steve Floyd here could become Sam Walton. Right, we're free despite the state. Right, exactly. The freedoms that we have is despite the state, not because of the state. And we're not complaining about people. Well, we do kind of complain about people that are complicit in what the state does. But the whole point is the state has done these things. They need to stop, and we'd be even a better country. I think that the big thing about this show is the fact that you guys are always broadcasting the fact that there is a difference between the people and the state. And the irony is, is the United States is like the only country in the entire world where the people don't seem to get that there's a difference between the people that live in the borders that classify as the United States and the government that lords over them. We that's the all people. Because, that's all because we, of free entry yeah. into government and democracy, uh-huh. but that's another show. And, and, I, and I've heard Josh say... That's actually uh, in the archives. That shows <laughs> on I've, I've heard Josh say on. many, many times that America is great in spite of the state. I mean, that's that's a good point. Well, all four of our lines are on hold right now. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Good, mo- good morning. Hey, this is Ben. Ben, what's on your mind? Hey, yes. To Dan... Uh, Step out of the box. You need to study the history of this country, know where it came from, know what it, where it's going. And uh, and to the guy before, I recommend Oath Keepers. Uh, check out that uh, that organization. There's some good people 
uh, that are fighting uh, for the good fight, uh, we're, we as human beings are supposed to be free, absolutely free. And uh, these constitutions and treaties and laws and everything are, are basically made by man. And uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, how should I say, inspired by the Creator. And uh, we have to look at the big picture, uh, you know, uh, bits and pieces here and there These are, are just puzzles that need to be put together. And I'm glad you guys are there to, to, to open the eyes of uh, people like me and, and, and others, you know. Uh, every day you guys are on, you make me realize something new. Hmm. And that's awesome. Thanks very much Thank for you. the phone call. Appreciate that. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Who's this? Good morning. Hey, who is this? This is Sam. Sam, go ahead. Hey, I'd like to address some of the things that, not the last fellow, but the fellow before him had said about, uh, you know, this being the greatest nation and all. It is. The people are great. Mm -hmm. The idea is great. The Constitution is a wonderful document if we follow it as it was written. But if you look back through history of America, ask the Sioux Nation, ask the Apache, ask all the indigenous people of this country um, how they were treated by the state or the government. Mm-hmm. Or, or, well, the Alaskan Natives ask, well, I, what can you say? Government is not a good thing for people. We need to be free. But it's, it, we've gotten such a mindset that everything has to be politicized. Everything has to be put in the context of us versus them instead of we the people anymore. It's, it's amazing. I mean, there was actually a religion in this country 150 years ago that there was an extermination act out for where you could shoot these people on the street like they were a dog and it was legal. <laughs> that's, that's America. You don't hear about that. But it's true. Just like with the natives and the blacks and whatever. I mean, government's yeah. just not a good thing. How do we make the people realize that, that we need to govern our own selves? Yeah, I don't and think we you can, can make can. them realize that. All you can do is live your life in such a way that they want to, to see, do they want what you have. Yeah, well, yeah it's, a, it's a hard road, but there's people like you, there's people like us, there's more of us out there, I think, than we know, and it's good. I mean, I'm glad that we have these conversations. I'm glad the guy called it said, pointed out that I mean, he was obviously pretty passionate about how he feels about the United States, and that's fine. We sure? agree, the people, but not the state. We have to disassociate the people of this country. I don't even like to use that word anymore. The people I that live I, here. I agree. I agree. We have to disassociate the state with the people because it's not the same. The cattle in this pen. <laughs> there right. you go. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks for the call. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. This is the Saturday funny. morning wake-up call. Who's on our phones? Hello. Is it me? It might be. depending oh. on who it is. <laughs> it is uh, this is Mandy. Na- Mandy, I'm sorry. It's not you. No, actually, oh. I'm joking. It is. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, This is my uh, favorite radio program, and it actually helps me, uh, gets me through the week. And uh, I just wanted to say quickly, in regards to the caller saying that uh, we were the freest um, nation, aren't we, uh, or doesn't America have the most jailed population per populace? Yes. Yes, we do. More people in jail than the rest of the civil, the rest of the free world. And if you look at the fact, combined. Combined, if yeah. You, if you look at the graph for the last 20 years, it literally jumps from like like a small percentage of, of the population. It just jumps like 10 or 15 percent. And 93 percent of the people in prison are political prisoners because they haven't actually hurt anybody else. They've only violated state crimes, state laws, Drugs, which is a political crime. Taxes. They're political prisoners. Driving, no difference. Driving. No different than Chinese, the communist Chinese throw people in jail for breaking laws that they put up. We call those political prisoners. Well, if they weren't communists, they wouldn't be in jail. Yeah, but... <laughs> uh, incidentally, China is number 123 on the list. you got to be kidding me. They are number 123 because in, in terms of population, they only have 121 persons per 100,000 Well, that's because they prison. kill everyone. That's because they have too many people. All right, Iran... Yeah, got? but they put people in prison for different... Uh, Iran is number 29 on the list. <laughs> How many people have we got per 100? Uh, we've got 730 <laughs> people per 100,000 in prison. Wow. Even Cuba only has 510 people per yeah, 100,000. They're number seven on the list. Freest place in the world. Russian Federation has 502 per 100,000. That makes them number eight on the list. You want to do any Who's other countries? Number two? Oh, number two is uh, St. Kitts and Nevis. 
<laughs> it's one of those little teeny tiny island nations. They've got 649 for 100,000 people. Because they've only got seven people on there. <laughs> <laughs> and I think if you pay $400,000, you can become a little citizen of uh, uh, yeah. Nevis. Number three is the Ooh. Seychelles. Number Passport four. Now? Yeah, buddy. I've looked into it. It's totally awesome. Number Just four is the Virgin money. Islands. Number five, Rwanda. Number six on the list is Georgia. Number seven, Cuba. Number eight, Russia. Number nine is Ang- Anguilla. I've never even... I mean, just part of the UK. Have you hmm. ever been there? All right. Um, <laughs> no. And number 10, the Virgin Islands. There you have it. Top 10. All right. 458 Talk is the number. Good. Those are the freest countries in the world? Those, no, those, <laughs> are the, well, those are the top 10 of the most people in prison. Oh, okay. 458 Talk, the number. Good morning. Who's this? This is Winston. Winston, what's on your mind? Uh, oh, you boys are all brave this morning. <laughs> uh, uh, um, or stupid. Well, uh, no, no, no. Uh, the the I thought I'd enlighten you on something. The 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 United States of America is a is a religion. Uh, 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 it, 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 it's it's uh, uh, the state is God to a lot of people. Yes, that's a very, very good point. Winston, we are up against the clock here, and I've got the hotline flashing at me. I mean, no, no that, is that for the next? Yeah. That's for the next Murphy, hour? Okay, that's our guest for the next hour, and we've got just a couple minutes left here. Uh, see if we can squeeze in that other last call. Good morning. Who's this? Good morning. This is Ben calling back. I forgot to mention the richest country in the world um, in what respect uh, uh, in relation to the Federal Reserve uh, the and the uh, Federal Reserve note, you need to know where they came from, and it's just a book entry. Yeah. There's no value to that dollar. Yeah. So uh, you're right. We are in uh, the, the, the <laughs> we are in debt, uh, and as far as uh, representation goes, even lawyers represent us when we go to court. I mean, the United States so represents everyone that shouldn't be. We should be. Presenting ourselves instead of instead of re-presenting. Would Ben? Would you say that the American experiment has failed? Barely. Yes. Uh, Definitely. Backly. Yeah. I, was just, I mean, in fact, yes. <laughs> Thinking back with uh, Winston's call, he's absolutely right. Why people defend mm-hmm. the state so much? Because it's their religion. Exactly. It is their god. The state well, is there god is, now. There is, there is a there is a difference. Don't forget between religion and spirituality. Religion is a man-made uh, uh, worship, okay? And spirit, spiritualism is uh, is a true form of worship. For every man, no other man can tell me how to worship or how to think or, or you know, I have responsibility of my own that no one can take over. That's where it stops. That's where the buck stops. But then again, we all have to work together to make ourselves as human beings uh, as as very, uh, how should I say, capable uh, of, of surviving. So in, in that respect, we have to work together. And that doesn't mean annihilating the weak and taking away from from the poor, et cetera, as yep. we live now. we got to get going, Ben. Thanks for calling in. And uh, Bob Murphy on the next hour. Bob Murphy coming up in the next hour. If you don't know who that is, Google him. He's on our hotline, and we're going to be talking with him coming up in Patriot's Lament, which is on the way right after the Fox News right here on KFAR. We are Local Talk Radio online at KFAR660.com. And on your smartphone with the TuneIn Radio app, just uh, install it free and look us up in the local radio section here in Fairbanks, Alaska. You've got it on KFAR. Fairbanks is listening. Talk radio for the interior. 660 AM. KFAR. Fairbanks. Freedom you hear coming right to your ear? Uh, It might be because you're listening to Patriot's Lament right here on KFAR's local talk radio. A show that is paid for by Bighorn Enterprises. Basically, this is just like, uh, in, well, I guess you could almost call it an infomercial in a sense, except <laughs> you guys aren't you aren't peddling anything except ideas, and, and it's been a, a pleasure being associated with you. Uh, would you like to introduce the guest on the phone, Josh? Yeah, today uh, we have Mr. Robert Murphy. Um, I got Sam Vanderwall in the studio with us, and he's going to basically run the discussion for us. Thanks, Sam. Go for it. Morning. So uh, for for those of our listeners who have maybe been living under a rock, 
I just have a little bit here about Bob Murphy. Robert Murphy is an economist who follows in the vein of the Austrian School of Economics. <clears throat> he received a Bachelor of Arts from Hillsdale College and then went to U New York University where he obtained a Ph.D. in 2003. His thesis had the riveting title of Unanticipated Intertemporal Change in Theories of Interest and dealt with the complex theory of capital. Since then, Dr. Murphy has worked as a portfolio analyst with Laffer Associates, uh, was a visiting assistant professor of economics at Hillsdale College, is currently a senior fellow at the Pacific Research Institute, is an adjunct scholar at the Ludwig von Mises Institute, writes for townhall.com, lerockwell.com, and is an economist with, uh, with the Institute for Energy Research. Um, additionally, he has been before the United States House Committee on Financial Services in a discussion on oil prices in the state of the U.S. dollar. He's published a number of books and essays, including The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Great Depression and the New Deal, Lessons for the Young Economist, and the essay Chaos Theory, which uh, Walter Black has some, some uh, very high praise for. Finally, Dr. Murphy is famous for challenging Paul Krugman to a debate on the Austrian theory of the business cycle, a theory which Krugman has repeatedly ridiculed yet refuses to actually op offer subs substantive uh, arguments against. <laughs> well, so welcome, Bob Murphy. Thanks for having me, guys. Do you want you want to go ahead and tell us about this debate with uh, debate challenge with Krugman real quick? I'll give you a yeah, chance sure, to plug sure this. Thing. Um, yeah, so as many of your listeners probably know, Paul Krugman is one of the biggest representatives of the Keynesian position, saying that during the a recession like we have the win right now, it's the government's job to step in with running big deficits and to provide more aggregate demand. Uh, most Austrian economists think that you know that's that's the exact wrong thing to do that the reason we're in the recession is because of the, the boom that the Federal Reserve in particular provided um, earlier in the 2000s, and that cutting interest rates and having the government try to stimulate spending is what got us into this mess. And so I have challenged Paul Krugman to that, uh, to debate that, and to sort of sweeten the pot, I, if people go to KrugmanDebate.com, they can get the full details, but what it is is people can make pledges. So if Krugman ever did agree to debate me, the money that is pledged then gets dinged on everyone's credit card and goes to a food bank in New York City. And so as of right now, there's like $80,000 that people have pledged so that if Paul Krugman ever deigned to debate me on business cycle theory, there's at least $80,000 right now that would go to a food bank in New York City, and, and yet it's, it's not important enough to him to, to do that. So that's the idea. So it's at KrugmanDebate.com if people want to see more. And it's a, it's a pretty safe bet because if Krugman doesn't debate you, the credit cards don't get charged, correct? Right. So, yeah, it's not that it takes your money and holds it. It's that you're just making a pledge saying, if he ever did debate me, then you would be charged. So, yeah. I don't think that food bank's going to be getting any donations from that anytime soon. <laughs> Why get crushed? <laughs> right. I mean, people, it's, it's, it makes sense that he wouldn't because, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a Nobel laureate and a big guy, and, you know, he, has a, he can only lose from that kind of confrontation. So, but nonetheless, it's fun to put him on the spot because certainly he's willing to go on talk shows and everything and, and, and give his opinion and say how the government should run bigger deficits. And so it's interesting that he chooses not to debate me. Fantastic. So on this radio show, we talk a lot about uh, liberty, but also the market as, as sort of a process for liberty. And uh, you've got a lot of writing on uh, some sort of uncommon applications for the market process. Um, you know, so most of the time people think that things like private defense or uh, things like uh, national defense um, uh, courts are, are the mainstays of, of government domain, right? So that the idea is, you know, national defense has to be taken care of by government. Courts have to be taken care of by government. Basically, law and defense. Um, even even some of the most free market people who will say that um, you should keep government out of almost all the areas of the economy will say that these are sort of the final holdouts where you act, absolutely have to have government intervention. But you've written a lot about uh, um, why that may not be the case. Can you can you go into some of the theory on that? Um, private defense services are they a viable option? And if so, why do you think that? Well, sure, you, and yeah, your your setup there was exactly right. That and of course. Personally, that, that's how I came around to this position, too. It, it's, you know, I used to be just call myself a conservative, and then I started calling myself a libertarian, and then I just kept pushing it more and more. And you know, If you can understand why, say, the state really shouldn't be involved in education and why you, know, you should really privatize that and return those things to the private sector, or you know, even easier, the, the, there shouldn't be a post office that has a monopoly. And well, why not? Well, because you have competition and then consumers have more options, there's better service, that sort of thing keeps people honest. Um, 
all that logic applies even to things like military defense and uh, the legal system. It's just conceptually, it's, it's harder to, to see, what, well, how could that even work? Because you, normally when you think about the free market working in building roads or you know, growing apples and getting them into grocery stores, we all know, oh, yeah, the free market can work in those areas, but it, it's because it presupposes this legal framework. And so that's really why it, it's so hard for a lot of people to get their heads around what would it mean if the state stepped back and allowed the market to provide judicial rulings and to provide military defense. So as, um, as you mentioned, it's my essay, or pamphlet, I should say, Chaos Theory spells all this out, and that's, that's free online if people want to see more. But just to give uh, brief remarks, it's um, in, a, in a free market, what, what it is that judges would do is provide opinions. And if you think about it, I mean, that's what they actually call it. When a judge writes up, it's called his or her opinion on the case. And so in a market, if, if people have disagreements over something, how about what the law says on some dispute, to get the community to realize well, who's, who's right on this dispute, you'd want to go to a, a respected third party, and that's what, what judges would do. And so the way they would maintain their clientele and the way they would earn a living being judges is that they would have a reputation for providing very fair rulings. And, and we see this now. I mean, this isn't complete science fiction. If people want to get divorced right now, usually they don't want to go through the messy court system. They go to arbitration. And so how do those people stay in business, it's because they have a reputation of being fair to both parties. If somebody was always on the wife's side or always on the husband's side, they would go out of business because, you know, the next couple getting divorced, the one party who would be at a disadvantage, so I'm not going to that guy. So you'd see that, I think, settle most of the things um, that would arise in, in everyday life. Um, as far as, as military defense, again, it seems like how could that possibly be provided by a free market? Well, here I think it would be insurance companies. That insurance companies would, you know, you have a skyscraper that you own, and you'd have fire insurance, so in case there's a fire, you want to get indemnified. And you could also have insurance saying, what if tanks sent by China come and start shooting at my thing and damage it? And you could have insurance policies on that. And so now the insurance companies are on the hook for defending this property because they know if it gets damaged, they're on the hook for it financially. So they would be the ones who would fund, you know, infantry and tanks and so forth. And there, I think it makes a lot more sense. Instead of having all the eggs in one basket and having a, a group of people in Washington planning the entire defense for the whole country and to, you know, being able to take our money against our will to pay for it, instead you'd have decentralized competing agencies doing that. And if some of them had a better idea, others would copy it. And the thing is, if they weren't doing a good job or if they were paying way too much for their hardware, you could switch to a competitor. So I yeah. think the logic that makes the market work better in all these other areas still applies even here. It's just a little bit trickier to see how could it get going. Can I add something to that? This is Aaron Bennett. I, I think the interesting thing about that ideology is um, insurance companies, it seems to me anyway, that they would add incentive on top of that. So they would give people a price break just like in any other uh, form of insurance like a non-smoker obviously gets a price break. So they would incentivize you to arm yourself as much as you possibly could. So overall, the national defense would be bristling, wouldn't it? Right, I think that's a good point. And actually, you know, it's we don't know how how things would play out. So it's, you know, if if the people ruling North Korea came to me and said, "Hey, what should we do?" and I said, "Well, you should, you know, free free everything and, and turn it over to the markets." And they said, well, how many grocery stores would there be next year if we listened to you? You know, my answer is I don't know. It's not that I'm centrally planning your economy. You let the market do it. So by the same token, you're right. When I'm trying to paint a picture of what would this look like, for all we know, there, were, there really wouldn't be an analog of right now the Army and Navy, that it would be so decentralized and it would mostly be, you know, individual households that would just have small arms and things like that. And it just – one thing that people should remember is if there's no – central state apparatus that can tax 40 percent of gdp from all the population there's some outside force there'd be nothing to conquer like if, if it were if the whole continental u.s right now were really just a bunch of private property owners and you know people of varying degrees of wealth and so on you couldn't just go and capture the capital city and take over the government and then rule the country because there'd be no apparatus of coercion that you could just replace the leaders with your own you know if you're a foreign army so it's it, just the, idea, the whole notion of what we're trying to think of, like, oh, we have to defend the country from outside invaders. 
why would anyone be even be trying to do that? It just it would be a, a sort of a very difficult process if you really did have this decentralized thing, and all these people, like you say, Aaron, or you know, many of them are armed to the teeth with just conventional weaponry and so forth. That it just wouldn't be worth it for somebody to send over a bunch of uh, you know battle groups and try to try to take them over because it would take you like 20 years to work your way across. That that's an awesome point. I never thought about it like that. But I mean, I was pushing more towards the fact that they wouldn't. At the very least, you wouldn't have an insurance company pushing you to disarm, to, to monopolize, to, to be able to enhance their monopoly on you, because it would be in their interest to have you better armed so they would have to afford less protection, less cost to themselves. It's all free market would say that they would want to spend less money. Yeah, oh, you're right, yeah, so you're right. I, I, did, I didn't get that aspect of what your, your comment was saying, but yeah, you're exactly right that right now, as, as many people know, the government, not just U.S. government, but you know, governments throughout history, often when they want to empower themselves, the first thing they have to do is disarm their own people because then it's easier for them to get away with what they want to do. And you're, you're right, the insurance companies in, a, in the free market analog of what we're imagining here, it would be the opposite, that if they're, the contractual relationship is they're saying, you pay us premiums every month, and then we agree that if an enemy bomber you know takes out your building and you get a hundred thousand dollars in property damage then we give you a check for a hundred thousand dollars and so they're going to want you to be able to defend yourself because then that makes you you know a less of a liability from their perspective right so some um some wonderful uh, surface air missiles on top of your skyscraper would be definitely be feasible <laughs> I, i'm just i'm just kidding what about the poor people We've we've brought this up here on this show, and people calling to go, oh, that's great for all you rich people out there that can afford insurance, blah, 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 but all that's going to do is the poor people out there, they're not going to have the money to buy insurance, and people are going to take advantage of them, and then they'll just all die. And So what do you say to the, quote-unquote, the poor people that couldn't afford the insurance? Well, there's, there's a couple things, and I guess it depends more on what the person is specifically talking about, but I mean, if, if it's just the contrast between a society that is private property and, and you know, everything's voluntary contracts versus our present society, I mean, everyone, first of all, would have at least 20% more income to work with yeah. just because you wouldn't be getting taxed. And I'm, I'm, that's a, a low end figure because we're talking about poor people who don't have as much of their income taken by this. So right there, they'd have that advantage. But I mean, if you just think about the stuff that poor people in today's society, I mean, they go to government run schools and receive an awful education uh you know if, if you're especially if you're a minority in certain cities i mean you you look at the police as like an occupying army i mean they don't look at the police as being there to serve and protect them it's you know they so it's um all of that would be completely different in the sort of society that we're talking about here so i i really don't think that um you know the poor and, and to the extent that if, if we all agree that, oh, yeah, we as a society want to take care of poor people and provide for them to make sure that no one's literally starving to death in the streets, well, then if we all agree on that and that's just a no-brainer, why do we need then to elect people to force us to contribute to that? If it's so obvious that that's the kind of society we want to live in, then why can't we all just voluntarily give our money to soup kitchens and, and other charitable organizations? Right. You know, with with a debate or something. <laughs> hey, uh, can I can I ask a follow up question? This, this is Steve Floyd. I'm I'm the monkey pushing the machine the uh, the buttons here. Uh, Robert, thanks for calling for being a part of the show today. On the private army issue, the the insurance companies having their own little private armies. One of the criticisms that I've heard of that idea is that they would somehow go out of control, and that it wouldn't matter to them if they killed bystanders, if they killed, if they wiped out entire neighborhoods, and. Uh, to me, I'm like, well wait, well, wait a second. What happens now if the government does that? It's just called collateral damage, and nobody seems to mind that we took out a, a baby formula factory instead of a weapons of mass destruction factory. How would you address the issue of a private army? What kind of accountability would there be if they took out the wrong guy, if they ended up destroying a neighborhood or something like that? But yeah, that's a great point, and... The society that I'm imagining and that I describe in chaos theory, no one is, quote, above the law. The same rules apply to everybody. So just because you're an insurance company and you have a bunch of, you know, trained personnel, guys who are sharpshooters and whatever and have armored vehicles who are in your uh, among your employees, that doesn't mean you can go and, and just kill people and get away with it. So 
the same legal system and legal rules would apply to everybody, whereas you're, you're right, that if people are worried about... It, it's just kind of funny. People use objections against uh, private property outcomes and then think, so therefore it follows that that's why we ought to have this monopoly government institution and give them all of the guns and nuclear bombs and so forth and, and flying robot drones that can kill people with no accountability. So it's true, power corrupts and no system is perfect, and you definitely want to be very careful before you start signing off on something where a small group of people um, have lethal capabilities. But if that's what you're worried about, the last thing in the world you should support is the, the modern state as we know it, because that concentrates all kinds of power in the hands of a few people. And you're right. They, if you want to talk about being able to get away with murder, it's what governments claim right now. You see, yeah, they call it collateral damage. And not even in, in foreign lands, but even, you know, look what happened in Waco and other places where they just say, oh, oops, you know, sorry, but yep. hey, we, we were just an honest mistake. And yeah, a bunch of people died, but hey, we're the government, so it's okay. We, we investigated it, and we cleared ourselves. Nothing, nothing bad happened. So Bob, <laughs> um, this is Aaron again. Isn't part of that, though, would be um, um, there would, in a free market, there would be more than one insurance company, and if they were trampling on this uh, theoretical neighborhood, those people would most likely uh, have an insurance company of their own. I mean, you're not talking about one centralized insurance company. You're talking about free market. Um, you can insure through more than one place. There'd be incentives, so on and so forth. And for obviously, an insurance company would be way less inclined because they would incur damages. They aren't the arbitrator, ultimate arbitrator in their own defense, like a centralized government is. So that they would be very careful about going and trampling and because it all comes down to money they're they're not going to go in, they don't want to pay out huge sums to another insurance company right it isn't isn't that more likely a scenario rather than oh we just really don't care we'll go ahead and damage anything that we see and if it all comes down to, you know to money it would be the same ideology of they wouldn't go start a war in the first place because there's no monetary gain in starting a war because there's nobody to pay, nobody's going to pay for that. People are paying for defense via insurance. Yeah, those are all, all great points, and it's um, you're you're emphasizing what I what I was saying there. That what I was saying, they're not above the law. So the remember the, the legal framework. I mean, there would be this body of law. People would know what the property rights. Are. Just like right now, people know what the rules of grammar are. But there are certain experts in the community that know them better, and they're the ones who write grammar books and you know codify definitions in the dictionaries and so on. But we all know the rules of grammar, and so I'm saying by the same token, people in a free society would know what the law said in terms of property damage and who did what and what was homicide. And there would be experts who would be, you know know certain nuances of the law and more than the common man would. But everybody would know if a tank just rolls up and blows up in a household that it was doing nothing, that that would be a crime, that that would be you know, a violation of property rights and so on. And so you're right. If some agency is out there doing that with impunity, all of the, ju the judges in the community, the judges wouldn't be on their payroll. These would be all the distinct things. There's not just one agency that makes all the legal rulings, that runs the prisons, that runs your health care and does all this other stuff and has all the tanks, which is what we have with the state. And so, yeah, this group could be doing that kind of stuff, and all the judges would be ruling and saying that they're a bunch of aggressors. And, and you're right, since there's competition, most people would stop sending their premiums to that company, and they'd switch to a company that wasn't just blatantly killing people. Whereas right now, if the police in your city you know, crack some heads to break up a riot or something, most people are just going to say, well, you know, law and order – because there's no competition. They think, well, we have to have police, whereas if there were 10 different police-type companies and one of them really was just always beating people up way more than needed to happen, the community would just switch to other ones that were more restrained when dealing with a violent crowd or something. And so those you know, aggressive ones would go out of business, whereas right now the police, you know, it's not like the chief of police gets fired if, somebody, if there's a, an incident of brutality on his watch. So it sounds to me like one of the key points is here is the assumption of a rule of law in either scenario. You know, e even even statists when they're arguing against this, they assume that their system is going to have a known rule of law, 
and you look at, look around at different countries, different nation states, and the ones that have a solid, consistent rule of law do better than ones that don't. So in in this society, for you know private insurance and defense companies, um, they would be bound by the law. So there'd have to be a rule of law. But that that brings up the question then, you know, who sets the rule of law? Um, and you talked a little bit about that at the beginning, but can you expand here uh, real quick before the break? I mean, just, and just talk a little bit about how you think private judges and courts might work. Sure. sure. And again, I re- I personally like the, the the language analogy, or you could talk about uh, you know science that there certainly are scientific principles, and no one is in charge of physics or in charge of biology, but yet there are objective standards in those things. And um, by the same token, it's law and property rights, and, and as to who's wrong in a, in a certain lawsuit and that kind of thing. These are not just arbitrary inventions of the human mind. I mean, that there's a, a certain structure to those things, so experts would be able to make rulings on them, that there, w- there would be a, a sort of right and wrong answer on clear-cut cases, and as long as there's competition, then if, if people, you know, one party sues somebody else, and then they take it to a bunch of third-party judges, it would be pretty clear w- who was right and who was wrong. And so... That's what I mean, that in a community like this where there's no central agency that has a monopoly on dispensing legal opinions with competition, there, I think there would arise a, a sort of community consensus reflecting what the general accepted norms were in the community. And, and that's the way the, the legal uh, rulings and, and precedent would evolve in a voluntary, spontaneous system. Isn't, isn't that... Um kind of reflected on how uh, natural law, in, in the laws that we have in America and the ones that you saw um, give a lot of liberties to Germany and to England, that's that's how they more or less arose anyway, is what you're talking about. Yeah, and in, and in particular, um, it, um, the, the common law period in, in, in British history is, is sort of the model of, of what I'm, you know, I'm just trying to take that and sort of uh, refine it or, or elaborate upon that. But you're right. I mean, so it's that, that's kind of what I meant, though, when I was saying it's not arbitrary. So it, people have these intuitive notions of what right and wrong is, and then the function of the law is sort of to codify that and to spell it out, because then there's weird cases where your intuition is not, it's not obvious who's right and who's wrong. And that's why you need to have formal rules, and you have to have contracts and things just to right, make we, sure both parties know what's going on. We, we've got to go to a break. More with Bob Murphy after this. You've got it on KFAR. Totally. Welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. We've got a full house today. Uh, real briefly, uh, Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises, Aaron Bennett from Far North Tactical, Sam Van der Hall with, uh, well, I, I don't know who you're really with. I'm with myself today. That's what I thought. Nice. He, actually, I think you're beside yourself. Are you an individual? Uh, yeah. Let, let's let the callers know that we're actually going to take some calls, so don't don't hang up. All right, we're going to take some calls as well. Uh, joining us, cool with Bob. Uh, actually from uh, uh, the Mises Institute and some other um, really big names like townhall.com, <laughs> we've got uh, Bob Murphy on the phone as well. Good morning, Bob. Thanks, guys. Good morning. All right, I, I just have a, a couple couple things to push back on, and, and let let's hear what you have to say about it, and then we'll take some calls, and you can uh, you can argue with our callers. Um, sure. So, so one of the criticisms of this sort of private private law or private defense, uh, people will say, well, you know, wouldn't it just turn into roving gangs fighting each other, and one one is eventually going to rise dominant, and then you end up with government again, except that now it's going to be a dictatorial government instead of one supposedly uh, you know, controlled by the people. You're right. That, that's, that, that is a common uh, objection. And so there, I mean, if we can, in the, the context of that question is to say, so instead of risking that outcome, that's why we in this civilized society have a democratically elected government, and every four years we go through da 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 da, and we all, you know, we, we disagree with each other on what the the right policies are, but we can, you know, agree to disagree, and then we have these orderly elections. So I'm saying, if you have that kind of society where we can have civil discourse, and then we agree to have elections, and we don't, you know, use violence to settle our problems, well, why would that population all of a sudden just turn into ro- ro- roving bands of, of, of gangs? If all of a sudden that that state apparatus weren't there, in other words, it's not that you you refrain from killing your neighbor when you think that the tax rate is one way or the other. If he, or if he disagrees with you on, on health care, just because the government's sitting right there, you right? Know I mean? so, so 
So well, we, it's true. If you look around the world, there are societies where the government has fallen, and then there are roving bands of, of, of warfare. But that those societies didn't work with the government either, because those people were just too violent. And so I'm saying, if you're looking at a nice, st- stable society where, with the government, things seem to be eh, pretty much okay, and why do we want to risk changing the system? I'm saying the reason that works is not because the government keeps everybody honest. The government actually is filled with the worst types of people in the society, like the ones who crave power and who are liars and so forth. They go to the government. They're, they are attracted to it. So it's not that the government keeps us all moral. It's that the, a society where it's tolerable to live with the core sort of people that the government has in power is a, is a virtuous people relative to other societies. And so I'm saying if you allow, if you decentralize the power, if you didn't have the monopoly state and the police and so forth and had competition, that wouldn't all of a sudden make violence more likely. It would make violence less likely. There'd be more respect for property rights if you just broke up that power and distributed it, which is, which is basically what we're saying. So you're saying that the sort of prerequisite is a a civilized society sort of brings up the age-old question, is liberty the mother of order or the daughter of order? But should we go ahead and take some calls? Yeah, I was just going to say real quick, um, the whole notion that we would all just start killing each other anyways is ridiculous. The only reason that we're not murdering each other is because of this government apparatus. I mean, they feed that to us. It's not... We can go out in the woods. I go hunting with my friends out in the woods, and I don't all of a sudden look around and say, there's no cops. I, I am going to kill now and start killing people. I mean, it's just a false. It's false. It's not how we are anyways. I mean, unless you're the Hobbesians, of course. They believe that. But, um, And we do have roaming gangs right now. They just have blue and red lights on top oh, of their Oh, snap. <laughs> if, if I could just uh, say one quick little anecdote the on that stuff. And you're right. I mean, I, I, you know, if, I, I'm coming from a Christian perspective, and in that sense, you know, man has fallen, so I'm not trying to say, oh, everyone naturally is, is an angel, no. but there is a sense in which it does take the institutional government to, to get people, there's, you know, anecdotes like in World War I, in the, in the trenches, where the men would, like, purposely shoot to, to not hit the people, any other, like, there was a sort of understanding that arose where both sides kind of purposely missed, because they, you know, that they realized we're not going to shoot you guys and you don't shoot us. And then the commanding officers realized this and they had to start, you know, they had to move the people around and, and break up that understanding because they're saying, no, no, we want you to kill those people even though, you know, you don't even know who they are. Because there's this, most people do not have this natural inboard urge to go just slaughter people that they don't even know. And it takes governments to sort of whip that up into you and, and to get that to happen. Right, it, and it's still, it seems like to me the underlying answer to all that is monetar- monetarily, it wouldn't make any sense. Well, we, be- we better take all some right, calls. All right, let's take yeah. some phone calls. 458-TALK is Somebody's the calling. number. Good morning, caller. You're on with Bob Murphy. Who's this? Hello? Can you hear Bob? Bob, can you hear him? Hello? This is Gilbert. Gilbert? Bob, yeah. are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, go ahead, Gilbert. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't realize I was the first caller. Hey, um, first of all, I love Bob. Do you guys know what a legend you have there on the phone? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. um, all right, Bob, my question is, because I hear this scenario, you know, I listen to you talk about that a lot, and I hear it. Do you envision this happening, or well, actually, do you envision this type of thing working within the framework of the current republic, meaning... If we had a more limited federal government, you know, without the 17th Amendment and the 10th Amendment was more honored and they only did what they were, uh, what we designed for them to do, do you envision that happening within the republic or or, or does it mean we have to uh, abolish the republic as we know it? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't want people to get discouraged. I, I personally don't think I'm going to see this kind of society in my lifetime. So, I mean, it just to see, because it, and, and what I'm doing with my work is just trying to paint a picture for people to show them, you know, just, uh, we don't need all of these monopoly institutions, and we, you know, you don't need to have this coercion, it's just an institutionalized apparatus. You could, we could imagine a free world. Um, so as far as, like, how would it play out, yeah, I, I'm not sure if what you're asking me, like, because some, cause some people mean, are saying, oh, well, we need to go, I mean, like, have floating I cities in the ocean. Time, we build, I, you know, that kind of, if that's what you're asking me, I think all of that stuff would is, is, is going to happen, that you're going to see people try to secede. So I guess my, the quick answer to your question is, for me, I think the quickest path would be if a state that had a lot of free-minded people tried to secede 
and they were allowed to get away with it. That's the way I would see this happening pretty, you know, in my lifetime, just something close to what I'm picturing. Potentially New Hampshire in 10 or 20 years? Um, conceivably, but it just geographically, they're kind of, I don't know if that location is going to work, but meaning, you know, just because they're surrounded kind of thing. But, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that could work. And I just, I'm just saying in general that the idea of, in other words, I, I don't, I can't see how anytime soon you're going to get a national consensus that, oh yeah, let's you know basically dismantle the, the federal government and go back to something like the Articles of Confederation. I, I just can't even imagine how that would play out while I'm still alive. Whereas I could see, yeah, like if, if enough people moved to New Hampshire or a bunch of people in Texas really got fed up and decided they wanted to be their own country, you know that kind of stuff. I could see that happening in the next 40 years. But if the federal government were to collapse before then, could you see this rising up in its place in, in, in terms of local communities? Okay, yeah, now, yeah, now that's a good question. So if, if it just falls apart of its own way, kind of like the Soviet Union did, yeah. that I could see also. So, yeah, that, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I was talking more about, like, an intellectual revolution that, you know, everyone just starts downloading my chaos theory, and they're like, oh, my God, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I don't see that happening anytime soon, but you're right. The, the U.S. government could just collapse financially, you know, if there's hyperinflation and the you know the dollar crashes, and then people just realize this doesn't make it, and it breaks apart of its own uh, dead weight. Then I could see, yeah, there'd be a bunch of, but even there, I'm not sure because people would be so scared. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And then the, the local, there would still be the state governments, and they're not going to be staffed by angels in those places, and they're going to just take advantage of the situation. And everyone's going to be so terrified in that kind of scenario that I think they would give up a lot of their liberty if somebody at the state level promised, oh, you know, you we're going to have martial law, but we'll keep you safe. All right. You, we got to take another call here. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning. This is Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hi, this is Tim. Tim, go ahead. Uh, well, Josh was uh, eating supper last night. We were having a discussion about uh, natural law, and he, uh, your caller went and touched on natural law. And uh, first they said, well, Judeo-Christian, and I pointed out because I was reading uh, 5,000 Year Leap that uh, Anglo-Saxon law it was what is termed common law or natural law. So it isn't necessarily a religious item. Yet then he came back and so it, we were saying well then this is universal probably universal and then it was brought out that honor killing are not only done, but are societally allowed. So how can you have things like honor killing and yet supposedly claim that there is a natural natural law involved there? Okay, it's uh, a good question. So it depends what you mean by natural law. So some people, they, they're referring to the actual historical tradition and what people who wrote on natural law meant. Or some people just mean it more of a generic term that there is a, how can I put it, like there's an an objectively correct law that applies to man because of his nature. So if if I say that, that doesn't mean everyone automatically obeys it. You know, just like I could say there's there's laws of economics, it doesn't mean that that you, you know, the governments around the world obey the laws of economics. I mean, they they can try to violate them and then bad stuff happens. So by this same token, I, I personally don't think honor killings make sense, and, or you know that's repugnant to me, and so I would say, well, the way I'm picturing law and what seems like natural law to me, that would be a violation, so I'm not... Uh, but if what you're saying is in certain societies that's acceptable, you're right. That, that, is, that is true, of course, and um, yet then on our, our level of considering natural law that is important repugnant and it and it has no balance or or equality of of the punishment fitting the crime well you'd simply in that kind of a society if you didn't agree with it if you're free you just secede from that society i mean that's the whole with the society that bob's looking at there's more than one you don't like where you're at because they believe in honor killings and you pack your bags and you go move over there to the people that don't believe in that we've we've talked about this a lot we kind of steal from uh, richard mayberry's whatever happened to justice uh, the, the simple what we consider a basic tone down the easiest way to talk about natural rights or common law um, natural law is just 
the simple do everything you've said to do and don't aggress on anyone's person or property. I mean, that's that's pretty universal with all people. And if if that society that you're in doesn't agree with that, then you leave. Yeah, Josh has a really good way of saying it, I think. He says your liberties end where somebody else's begin. Thanks for the phone call. 458-TALK is the number. Let's see if we can squeeze in a couple more here. Good morning. Who's this? Yeah, good morning. Uh, Frank Journey here. Hey, Frank. Frank. Good morning. Hello. Go ahead, Hello, Frank. Hello, this is Frank. Go ahead, Frank. Hello? Yeah, Frank, can you hear me now? You're on, okay, Frank. Okay, I, I apologize. I, I have a question for the guest. I'd like to say something first. Uh, you know, when it comes to laws from our own state legislature and Congress, you mentioned the rural law, common law, natural law. But what about the real check and balances that we need more of? And that's fully informed juries and jury nullification rights. And maybe you can elaborate that. And I appreciate the show. Thanks for the call. Okay, yeah, uh, great question. Um, so, so here, if what the caller is saying is that in, in the present system right now, that really one of the, the bulwarks against oppression and, and the way that we can sort of push back against what we think is an unjust state is that juries need to be educated and, and realize that even if someone is technically guilty of whatever the formal statutory crime was, if you don't think that it, it makes that it's just it's serving justice to convict the person, then you can just you know refuse to convict even though technically the person violated the what, what the legislators wrote in the books. So I, I certainly uh, a, a agree with that um, as, as far as like what can we do right now and I would recommend that people have the Tom Woods has an excellent book on you know called nullification that that's and he thinks that's really a big thing it, it, it's sort of like goes hand in hand with, with secession that rather than us trying to reform the whole system from the top down which if you think it's really an inherently corrupt system that's an impossible task what can you do to sort of short circuit the system and, and shield yourself from it right uh, this is Steve again I've got to follow up on that because it seems to me you mentioned earlier about the rule of law and that the people would know what the law is just like we know what the rules of grammar are the problem is that right now you can't know what the law is we we don't know what the law is things are changing so frequently and so uh, unpredictably that you can't enter into business you can't make a plan for vacation you can't travel you don't know. We don't know. You can't even pack your bag for next week because you don't know what you're going to be allowed to take on the plane next week. How can yeah, we? How can we have a rule of point. law? And um, if people are familiar with uh, Friedrich Hayek, uh, you know he has a famous series called Law, Legislation, and Liberty. And the and, and part of what he was getting at there is there is a distinction between law and legislation. And some people don't realize this, but historically, the the, the people ruling society, you know, like the political authorities. They didn't think they had the power to make law. They just thought the law was what it was. You know, if they believed in a god, or if they just believed that this is the way things are, and they were enforcing it. And then it was it was a more modern inter, uh, invention, and in you know the hubris of the modern minds to think that the people running the government had the authority to actually change. You know, so with a better term, that's why Hayek said the better term is legislation. And so, yeah, when I'm talking about the, the rule of law, I'm talking about, like, bedrock principles and things reflecting the nature of human beings and property rights and so on, whereas, yeah, the, the legislators go and they just dabble and change things, and it gets to the point where you don't even, like you say, you don't, you don't even know what's on the books anymore because no one could possibly read all that stuff. Like, even the people in Congress admit they, they sign or they vote for bills without having read them because how could they possibly read that stuff? They don't have enough time. <clears throat> and they don't they don't bother to repeal a lot of them. So you have a lot of old archaic law still on the books. But we we got a question from somebody here in the studio for you. Well let's, let's oh, there's take, one more take call. the caller and I'll ask. All right. One last call. Four five eight talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Randy. Randy, go ahead. Uh, earlier in the show your guest said that no one is above the law and also you can't kill people and get away with it, and I agree with that, by the way. But there's a movie that you probably might have seen, uh, called Pale Rider with Clint e Eastwood. Did anybody see that movie? Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, there were some tin panners downstream uh, doing their mining, and they had a rightful ownership of that land. But another big miner who was owned by a guy named LaHood, he hired his own private service, uh, Marshal Stockburn and his six deputies, to come in and enforce the law as he saw it. Now, if, if uh, LaHood had hired a judge and these uh, Marshal Stockburn and his six deputies and killed off some of these tin panners, do, and does that stand, or is there some higher law that he has to answer to? 
That's all um, yours, Bob. Unfortunately, I haven't seen that movie, so I, I can't answer you in the context of and, and talk about the characters and say what would have happened because I, I just haven't seen that movie. Um, what I can say is, though, uh, I would encourage you to read, you can just Google it and get it for free, the essay, The Not-So-Wild Wild West. Right. And uh, <laughs> that's a, it's a scholarly journal article that just goes through and shows how Hollywood has led us to believe that you know, there was all these gunslingers and stuff, and that all oh, back in the day it was in Tombstone or whatever. Just, you were, if, you, if you walked outside, you're probably going to get shot, and that that wasn't the case. And, and he specifically does deal with like uh, the gold gold rush and so on, because all these settlers went out there before a formal government apparatus had been set up, and that there was all sorts of things like what I'm talking about. That there were uh, just these elders and you know respected members who would who would make rulings on disputes, and that violence was actually pretty rare. Um, where you did see violence was with the, the people moving cattle, and that makes sense. And they and they did have to hire gunslingers, and it makes sense because there there was no people weren't settled, and so you didn't get to know your neighbors. It was just if somebody stole your horse and was trying to make off with them, all you really could do was hire gunslingers to go hunt the guy down. But in terms of settled communities where people saw each other day in and day out, it was actually pretty peaceful. And I wonder if uh, there was more violence in the west or in the inner cities in the east. Well, yeah, I don't know that that particular comparison, but what, the, what they do show in that essay, again, called The Not-So-Wild Wild West, it's fascinating, if I'd encourage people to go Google that, is that they were looking at statistics and things that showing that the homicide rates you know, were lower in the periods when I think a lot of Americans now would think, oh my gosh, I bet you that was just people you know, getting just piling up corpses in the streets, and, and, and no, it wasn't, the, the per capita homicides were pretty low, and maybe in fact been lower than like in London at the same time. Yeah, the real killing didn't really, the violence didn't really start till the state started moving west. Right, yeah, and if you want to talk about move. just mass slaughter, of course, it was the army going through and killing all the mm -hmm. people who had lived there before. You know, I mean, so it's if you want to like say systematically who were all the, the and of course then during the war between the states or civil war, depending on what you want to call it. I mean, in terms of just massive institutionalized bloodshed that's not from individuals having a disagreement or some greedy guy trying to move in on someone's territory that is the state insta you know formal apparatus is systematically killing people yep yeah it's called democide 220 million people killed by the state in the 20th century wow all right do we go to do, Abe, or do we go to the phones well, let's take the one last call real quick. You really keep on getting one last call if we do it that way. Good morning, caller. <laughs> who is this? Hello? Hey, who is this? Uh, oh, uh, oh, this is Gilbert again. Gilbert again. What's on your mind? Oh, oh sorry. I I, didn't, I was just calling because I couldn't get it on the Internet anymore. Um, well, you know, I guess I will ask. We'll then, post uh, it up soon next week. Yeah. Well, I, well, I did, I did want to ask. I know Bob writes more in the style of Mises where he's not trying to really persuade people where, where he's just trying to lay out the facts about the reality of the state. And, but how do we realistically, I guess, just get more Austrian economics in front of people and the libertarian, well, the liberty movement in front of more people realistically? All right. Bob, how do you do that? Okay. It, yeah, it's a good question. And by the way, I should probably give the disclaimer that I under, you know, it's, a, it's a radio show and we're trying to be fit. I understand that the stuff we're talking about sounds crazy to somebody who's never thought of this stuff. So let me just at least acknowledge that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it, what I what I try to do in my work, because for me, I I think a lot of people generally like the idea of having competition, and you know they realize that there's something funky about taxation. Where, well, gee, what if I don't support the war in Afghanistan, or what if I don't support the drug war? What if I don't like my money being used to fund, you know? Uh, certain educational programs about using condoms and things like that. Abortion. That, you know, that they understand that, it, 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 you know, they think, oh, in a perfect world, the government couldn't take money from you and use it for things you didn't approve of, but they think, but we have to have that system because otherwise bad foreign people will come and take over and, and, and conquer us. And so that's what I'm just trying to show logistically that, no, if, if that's not the case, if actually the market could defend us and repel foreign invaders, then I think a lot of people, just the default presumption for liberty and not having this institution that could take your money against your will because, hey, it lets you cast a vote every four years, and that's the sense in which you can protect your own money. Um, I think the support for that would wither away pretty quickly, but that, that's a huge uh, stumbling block is to get people to think through and realize that this 
centralized state apparatus, maybe we don't need it to, to keep us safe. Yeah. You know, like they keep telling us we need them. Bob, this is Steve again. I, I'm, I'm kind of curious here as we're following up on that last caller's issue here of how do we let people know. Isn't there an awful lot of the problem here is that we have been so thoroughly indoctrinated by the state in terms of how we think about things, our education from the moment that we were five years old all the way through our 20s, we are inculcated with this idea that somehow we need the state to tell us what to do. We are inculcated with this idea that laws are not something like gravity or physics, things that are unchangeable, but rather they are things that can be changed if enough of us get together and decide to change the law. Isn't that part of the big problem here? We, yeah, that's, that certainly is, and... And I'm, uh, everybody knows this, but I mean that's that's why it's not a coincidence that the government likes to run the schools, <laughs> that they want to be able to approve curricula that even the private schools use, and they want to be able to license, you know, homeschooling parents or you know make them get past certain things, because they want to make sure they control exactly what every person learns from the moment they're born to when they become adults, so that they. You don't don't question the overall system that they go to work, they pay their taxes, and they you know don't don't become rabble rousers and don't start asking, well, wait a minute, why do we need this group of people in Washington that has so much power over us? What would happen? And what's funny is, uh, just to give you a quick example: the the, the the Terminator movies. There was a there was one when like Skynet takes over, and I remember when I was watching that, even with my views, and there's a moment when like the national defense system goes down like they're showing it from the war room inside the pentagon or something and for a moment as me watching the movie i got nervous like oh no now we're vulnerable to attack from you know china and like because even i had been just been drilled in my head since i was little that we need to have all those guys in the pentagon otherwise you know the rest of the world's just waiting to take us over and it's only because they spend hundreds of billions of dollars to keep us safe and you know whereas of course from most people's perspective the rest of the world the u.s is clearly running the world in terms of military power, and the idea that I'm worried about somebody in Mexico taking over the U.S. it would be absurd to them. We have a uh, we've I'll let you get. <laughs> it's been we've been getting beat up here the last few months because we've we are uh, totally against voting, participating in the system, and giving our consent to an evil system. So I'd just like to ask you, Bob, who who are you voting this uh, November sixth? Who are you voting for? In, uh, <laughs> Yeah, Mid- you're, Mid- yeah, Mid- Obama or yeah. Obama? Liam yeah, Neeson, I, um, obviously, right? I also decided, I don't know, this was like I don't know, five or six years ago that I just realized I was going to stop voting on principle Yay. for the same same type of reason that, I mean, I used to do it, and of course I I didn't vote for the the Republican or Democrat. I would I would vote for some third party, and I'd spend a lot of time strategizing about which third party candidate do I want to vote for, but. I mean, as an economist, you can recognize that your individual vote is completely insignificant, is not going to affect the outcome. And then when, and, and people don't like that kind of art. They say, oh, but if everyone thought like you, and I say, yeah, exactly. If everyone just stopped voting, it would be clear that the system has no legitimacy. So I want everyone to act like me. So I am doing, by not voting, I am doing the action that I wish would be universalized, that they, the, the reason the system has this, patent of respectability is because there are elections every four years. And so when you complain and say, but wait a minute, I don't want my money going to fund X, Y, and Z, and I don't think we should have drones doing all this stuff, people just say to you, well, we have elections, you should vote the bums out then. You know, and that's such a hollow response because the whole system is, is completely rigged that, you know, the two candidates are basically the same in every election. Yeah. So the only way to get out of that, it seems to me, is if more and more people just stop playing that game. And, you know, you can, but it's not like I think that someone who does vote for a third party candidate is doing something intrinsically immoral. I'm just saying strategically, I don't think that makes much sense. I think it's better just to try to educate people and not try to vote in the better guy. You just said probably the most dangerous thing that you've said all morning. (laughs) Asking people to withdraw their consent is probably the most revolutionary thing that any of us could do. Because as long as we are giving consent to the boot on our throat, we are agreeing with it, aren't we? Quickly, uh, do you have a website, Mr. Murphy? Yeah, it's uh, consultingbyrpn.com. 
consultingbyrpm.com. And we'll try to get this show posted up on our website here within the, within the week. And thank you very much for coming on the show, Robert. That was awesome. Amazing. And awesome. You can, Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. And you can also check us out online at patriotslament.blogspot.com. Or the YouTube channel is Radio Free Fairbanks. And uh, email is patriotslament at gmail.com.